So I just want to touch on on, on surface protection, just to scope out the uh, application. Most of the most interior or exterior parts are subject to a lesser or greater extent uh, by the effect of the environment they're flying in, be that rain, snow, um, hail, sand, etc., etc. Now, obviously, different parts of the aircraft are going to be affected uh, differently. Obviously, aircraft interiors are not exposed to uh, as much uh, of the environment, uh, external elements, uh, but aircraft interiors do have their issues. Uh, fixed wing and rotary wings obviously fly in different uh, environments, so their erosion um, effect or the effects of erosion are going to be slightly different. Obviously, the material has an impact, so metal is obviously a bit more, is, is obviously more durable uh, than composites. And as you see, there's no one um, no one universal solution uh, for protecting aircraft, uh, and that's why we've developed over the years uh, a quite extensive sort of portfolio of products to cover. Not all applications, but uh, certainly a lot of uh, applications. So let's have a look at uh, uh, erosion. Uh, and if it, definition of erosion. I mean, def it's, it's, it, if you look in the sort of dictionary definition, uh, it's a process for which an environmental agent removes material from one location and deposits it sort of to another. And we've all seen instances of coastal erosion, uh, particularly in the UK. Um, and also, we know that uh, from our geography lessons at school, uh, our longshore drift where the, the, the sand is deposited further up the coast. So that's the process of actually redepositing the eroded material in a different location. Uh, and obviously, erosion is dependent on particularly the material that is being eroded. Obviously, harder materials are going to be more difficult to wear away. The media or stroke agent that is actually doing the eroding um, yeah, obviously tougher, uh, more hard grits and materials are going to be more abrasive uh, and more uh, um, aggressive chemicals are going to be more, um, more acidic chemicals are going to do more damage. And obviously it's time dependent as well. Uh, we know from that, if, back from our sort of geography lessons that whole mountains and whole uh, ranges are being eroded over time. And you can see here sort of what happens, the effect of uh, uh, wind erosion on a, on a particularly weak sandstone type material and it's just taking away most of the material off. That would have been a a much bigger, more um, imposing mounting uh, several hundred years ago. I'm not quite sure what the time scale was. So, but if we then try and relate what's happening in from out sort of uh, from the, um, the from the environment to to an aerospace uh, applications, we think that obviously paint uh, is is relatively easy to remove, uh, which again can sort of lead to sort of direct access to the surfaces underneath, which are the, then themselves then vulnerable to uh, er erosion. And it's obviously, obviously it has huge implications given that uh, most of the flight surfaces and most of the metallic parts on aircraft are actually coated in paint uh, and it tends to be a fairly similar type of uh, chemistry of paint. So, and we know composites are particularly vulnerable for, to, to erosion. Epoxy uh, composites, epoxy may be a very uh, chemically resistant material as, as, as a chemistry, but it is not. It, it, it's very tough and very uh, has high fracture toughness, etc. But in an erosion environment, it is not particularly uh, uh, stable. So what happens in basic terms in erosion is basically, crudely, is is bits of the aircraft are actually being removed. Uh, very small, thin like layers are being taken away by the action of uh, the environment. Uh, sand again, sand, rain, so, so those sorts of things, uh, and then revealing, if you like, the surface underneath that that are particularly more vulnerable, more prone to, to damage. So to touch on sort of uh, foreign object damage, just again as a definition, or FOD as it is, 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 is known. It basically, it's the definition again of FOD is any damage that could be attributed to a, a, an alien object that's outside of the design of the vehicle system. Um, that's normally now taken to mean the debris or media itself and the resulting damage caused by this debris is referred to as FOD damage. Um, this is particularly relevant uh, to exteriors as well as interiors and all subjects, oh, sorry, but all substrates are vulnerable to uh, impact by objects. So FOD can be caused by any type of material that is sort of alien and not part of the uh, aircraft structure. And when we're dealing particularly on erosion, we're talking particularly sand, uh, stone chip gravel, 
uh, rain and hail uh, and other sort of uh, airborne uh, particles. Uh, we, we, we offer uh, to solutions using a combination of uh, PU technology. I'll come on to why PU is uh, polyurethane a big problem. Is, uh, the, probably, be, probably the best sort of material to be using for these types of applications. And then we combine that with attachment solutions to provide a, uh, a product bespoke for the particular application and, and environment that the aircraft or helicopter or whatever is actually uh, operating in. So that then it keeps that aircraft serviceable, which means it's uh, available to be used more times for, for, for the owners and for the end users. Um, if you can then better protect surfaces and provide a more robust surface, you can then start to use lighter material or less robust materials underneath that uh, protection coating. So you can use lighter more uh, materials, i.e. composites. Uh, and also then the existing parts, if you can then protect uh, the more met metallic parts uh, from being attacked by the uh, the environment, then you can then start to uh, reduce or protect the erosion. So what I want to do is just touch on uh, the first of those, uh, and your sand erosion. And there's been a lot of publicity uh, recently, in, and you'll see obviously with where uh, a lot of military aircraft have been operating in recent terms, uh, that sand and dust uh, erosion has become quite an issue. Um, basically what happens is the sand and dust particles in the airstream, actually physically abrade and re start removing some of the flight surface material. It's effectively like flying through sandpaper. Uh, you know, and you'll see from some pictures in a minute uh, what, what, what I mean. Paint finishes and epoxy surface in films, metallic erosion silt are all vulnerable to this uh, erosion. And even some of the so-called the erosion shields that are used on leading edges and usually titanium or nickel erosion shields themselves are quite readily abraded. Um, you know, 3M quite, has quite a chem, uh, technology in abrasion that we understand and we supply a lot of uh, abrasion materials for actually reduce, reduce, removing metal and, and, and cutting metal, etc. So we understand the effects of uh, abrasive media on, on, on metal and other substrates. So once that is, uh, the erosion has started and you've taken away your immediate layer of protection, be that paint or be that an uh, erosion shield, you're then leaving uh, the substrate below. It's either, cut, it's either composite or, or metal uh, open and exposed uh, to the elements, which could start to compromise the integrity of that part if it's, if it's a composite part. And there's like a, a potential site for corrosion if it's metallic, uh, all of which you're going to need require remedial or servicing or repair before um, they can re-enter re -enter service. just want to highlight uh, the sort of environment that uh, some yeah, aircraft are operating in. As you can see, that's a helicopter uh, onto the left side there in what's called a brownout. Um, basically, as they, as they land, they kick up a huge amount of dust, as you can see. Uh, and of course, the rotate, rotors are still spinning at this stage, and so they're operating uh, the tip speeds are quite fast. Um, I'm not an expert on these things, but I think there's something like 0.8 the speed of sound, I think, uh, right at the tip speed. I don't know if that's correct, but it's that sort of magnitude of speed operating you know, just rotating through effectively what is uh, airborne sandpaper. And you can see the sorts of damage that occurs. And this is uh, this damage is not a long-term damage. This, this sort of paint loss here, and you can see it, the um, top coat, the green top coat has been removed to reveal the yellow uh, primer coat and even that has been removed to reveal the actual bare composite underneath. And that sort of uh, damage occurs very rapidly, even sometimes after one or two sorties. So you can see that you know, sand erosion is quite a sort of a, a very abrasive and very, uh, and very damaging uh, type of erosion. Uh, the next one I'm going to talk on to is, is rain erosion. Um, different type of erosion and a different mechanism uh, and, 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 and how the actual rain actually damages the actual components. It works in a different, different sort of mechanics. So what happens is basically the force from, from high water droplets um, impacts, they cause sort of like a pressure wave. You know, a, a, you know, quite a few tons per square inch on the sample surface. These 
species, then of course stresses within the substrate, which causes and then eventually will end in fatigue and ends up in, in, in brittleness. Uh, or if it's a tough material or if it's a ductile material, it, it, it ends up uh, de deforming it. What happens then is the mo moisture then starts to leach away, if you like, those loosened particles, thus reducing the mass of the, the surface. So you end up with um, re reduced surface, you end up with material being taken away. And here you can see an operation with a, uh, a, t a tail fin of a uh, commercial liner that's gone through a hailstorm. And you can see uh, it's just taken the paint weight uh, straight down to the bare uh, aluminium. That obviously is going to require uh, immediate repainting, uh, which means, again, downtime and cost for the customer. Better to try and protect that in the first place so you don't have to put in the service time or the service burden to rectify the issues. And here you can see at the bottom here the sort of effect that rain has. Um, these two samples here are aluminium and epoxy substrates uh, on an aerofoil uh, that rotates at 500 mile an hour uh, in a rain, like simulated rain uh, machine uh, that, give, that generates two, two millimeter drop size and you can see that on the, the composite side it started to damage and go into the composite and it started to damage the composite even after 10 minutes. Uh, and on the uh, right hand side you can see the aluminium has taken the top coat, has taken down the uh, epoxy primer and, and taken it down to the bare aluminium uh, and that only took 45 minutes to do that. So, and obviously on each picture, on the right hand side of each picture, that then is obviously protected uh, with uh, 3M polyurethane. So you can see the effect that protection of uh, a surface has, uh, that it uh, certainly reduces the amount of damage. And all this means that you know, there's less damage, aircraft are then <coughs> more readily available and, more, and, and, and serviceable. <coughs> Corrosion. Um, we all know about corrosion uh, on, on aircraft uh, is obviously a huge issue. Um, basically, definition is the, the gradual destruction of materials due to a chemical reaction with the environment. And uh, we know that uh, aluminium is uh, pretty vulnerable uh, to oxidation with the with, with uh, the atmosphere. We know it builds up oxide layers. That's normally uh, controlled when in the manufacture of the parts by going through uh, acid anodizing. Uh, etching and anodizing process, which is then sealed uh, to prevent the reaction occur reoccurring uh, with, uh, in this case, uh, paint and, and primers. Now, that's all very well, and, that, and the part is then fine, and, and, and that is then <coughs> protected from the environment. But what can happen is if that gets damaged, then obviously then that opens up a, uh, uh, an area for corrosion. Uh, if, if the area, if the paint is then taken away and you're down to the bare aluminium, that reaction, that oxidized reaction with the atmosphere starts to occur, leading to an oxide layer buildup, uh, uh, which then can start to creep underneath the paint finish and ultimately get into bonded joints, uh, and then perhaps causing weakness and, and potential failure of, of bonded joints. Now in terms of corrosion on the inter on inside of aircraft, um, you know, we get acid fluids uh, from what are called wet areas, uh, that's the galleries and the toilets. I won't go in, uh, people are in the lunch, so I'll try to be too delicate. But things like coffee, tea and uh, urine uh, do migrate through the floorboards. Uh, and uh, given that these are particularly acidic type materials, uh, they do then react with the floor beams below that support the uh, floor section. Ultimately, can end up uh, if there's uh, a scribe line in the uh, in the paint finish, corroding the floorboards. Oh, sorry, floor beams. I beg your pardon. Uh, which is a huge servicing cost. It takes uh, an extra two weeks to replace all the floor beams at the C check. So the solution to that is don't let it happen. Um, you can't control spillages, etc. But what you can do is, and what we 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 3M help with is provide a uh, polyurethane barrier between the floor ring and the floor boards that stops these fluids uh, seeping through the floor boards in the first place, uh, thus stopping them, prevent, stopping them reaching the uh, floor beams, and therefore uh, reducing the amount of corrosion. Another environmental influence, this time not necessarily to do with erosion, but obviously uh, is, is potential damaging to aircraft and therefore uh, 
in, 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 in the, uh, as a topic of the presentation with protecting aircraft, we've included uh, lightning strike. Um, a de you know, lightning definition is electrical discharge between the, on, on object, uh, the atmosphere and object. Fixed wing aircraft are pretty vulnerable, as in they're flying uh, between where most of the lightning events occur, uh, i.e., through sort of between and through and between the clouds. The estimate is that uh, each commercial airliner averages at least one lightning hit per year. Uh, and protection of lightning strikes is particularly key to <laughs> passenger safety. You know, lightning bolts can actually start to affect not only physical damage to the aircraft, but the systems and the, the, the electrical systems, electrical control systems. That's never been uh, particularly a problem with metallic aircraft, uh, due to the you know metal being very conductive. The aircraft then is effectively a huge Faraday cage that dissipates the energy from the lightning strike around the whole of the airframe thus reducing the potential damage for it. That, however, is an issue with composites because composite carbon fiber not being uh, very conductive uh, means that uh, any lightning strike uh, hits it and is not conducted away. That energy is, is full focus, the lightning bolt energy is focused into one particular area and can cause quite severe damage to composite structures. So what you need then is to build in uh, a system that compensates for the lack of conductivity uh, in the uh, in the composite, and the solution to that is to create a conductive path uh, in the composite composite's outer skin. Uh, typically, you use a lightweight lightweight copper mesh or foil that's been embedded into an epoxy servicing film, so you're providing uh, conductivity as well as a nice, smooth, tough surface finish uh, below the paint surface. Uh, these then are then then connected to metal bonding strips and other structures which create a conductive path basically uh, to fall to, to either a metallic plate or such as an engine or anything else or, or an fuselage. What that then effectively does is creates a, a conductive path to earth, uh, then dissipating the energy. Um, so as if it strikes the aircraft, that energy then runs along, uh, runs along the uh, lightning strike copper to the uh, conduct conductive copper strips, then down to the engine or, or, or big plate in the fuselage, the energy is then dissipated, so the damage is considerably reduced. So what are the benefits of, of protecting your aircraft, apart from some of the obvious? Obviously what you're doing is you're protecting the structural integrity of the airframe in, in, in service or any of the parts uh, from being comp compromised. It extends the durability and life aircraft and the life cycle of the aircraft. Um, so, obviously, the parts that uh, you know, where, where there's no damage obviously last a lot longer. There's no need for those parts to be repaired or and/or serviced, uh, and that avoids sort of lengthy and expensive um, periods of, of of those platforms being out of service uh, and not being written, and, and therefore not being ready for uh, not having fleet readiness. And also, um, so, you know, if you're going to get damaged to obviously the paint and removal of paint, it looks a bit unsightly, frankly. Uh, and no sort of airline likes that sort of thing. Passengers don't like to see the bits of paint removed as they're climbing up the steps. Um, it tends to give a bad impression of the serviceability of the aircraft, so so it has the effect of also uh, in keeping the aesthetics as the uh, the airline or the owner would like would like. So what I'll touch on now is uh, so one of the methods, having highlighted all the issues that uh, can can affect uh, erosion and, and the damage that these um, environmental environmental factors uh, can cause. So one of the solutions in order to protect against these uh, types of conditions. Uh, firstly, obviously, the existing one has been, and the one that's been around for a long time is obviously paint. Um, it offers a relatively minimum layer of protection. Even the toughened epoxy paints that are used today, the two-part epoxy paints that are used today, whilst they are epoxy is a very, very chemically resistant material and, and, and it has resistance to sky drill and fuel and all those good things that, 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 the, that the surface can come in contact with. Epoxy is a relatively brittle material uh, and does not have the yield in it that allows it to uh, absorb the impact 
uh, from the small impacts that you get from the rain droplets and the sand particles. Uh, and eventually, it, because it's a tough material, eventually that gets eroded. So whilst it is a very good seal and a very good coverage, it is tends to be, as a, as, as a chemistry, not particularly resistant to erosion. Um, obviously, the paint in there is obviously providing again the aesthetics and the brand and, and then other sorts of functionalities that uh, uh, you can put in for red absorption and all those good, those sorts of things that, that can go into paint. So, and it, it's a very old technology, but it, and it forms an important function in itself. But it is not really uh, as resistant, particularly to the leading edges. Obviously, on the less um, strained parts and the and the parts that are. Uh, less in the airstream, then paint is probably fine. It's not getting, not seeing sufficient erosion uh, for it to be worn away. But on the leading edges of the tails, the fins, the, the horizontal vertical stabilizers, the leading edges of most uh, aircraft and, and sort of uh, air inlets and those sorts of things where the airflow is considerably higher, uh, then uh, epoxy paint, from our experience, is 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 not uh, durable enough. So another technology around then is so what you do. The next sort of uh, chemistry up are sprayable coatings, which tend to be again polyurethane, and keep mentioned polyurethane on pumps as to why that that that, that product, uh, that chemistry, if you like, works so well. Sprayable surface coatings again, they're easy, they're, they're relatively easy to apply large areas on. Uh, again, they're sprayable, um, and you can come come in a hot, wide range of modulus or moduli. So you can have a very very soft material and a very very hard material. Now. Uh, Science seems to be split as to whether a hard material, a hard or more durable material, uh, is going to provide you more long-term protection than a softer material. They both have um, their benefits, and really, there's no agreement as to whether you have to go a very tough polyurethane material that lasts for an awful long time, or a relatively soft material that is relatively easy to replace. And so, there are pros and cons with each type of. Uh, solution in, in terms of sprayable coatings. The issue with sprayable coatings is particularly they, uh, most of them are taken up into solvent uh, and also there are also two part systems so there's isocyanates involved if it's polyurethanes and so there are VHC, uh, VOC and health and safety implications. Uh, and then the third and one which is obviously what 3M are, are more important is uh, tape particularly tend, generally tend to be self-adhesive uh, normally retro applied so they're applied to the finished aircraft uh, in service uh, to maintain its uh, availability. Uh, and being thermoplastic, uh, they are, can be molded into all sorts of 3D shapes to cover radones, uh, antenna, etc. Key thing about tape is because it's extruded, uh, it, control, it has a controlled caliper. I'll come on to a, a bit more about this uh, later on. As I mentioned before, historically polyurethane uh, has been used for uh, the manufacture of all, uh, of both tape and sprayable coatings, uh, and there's a there's a reason for that, which I should come to now. So why do we use polyurethane uh, as a chemistry? Well, basically, it's an underlying what polyurethane polyurethane is. It's a, uh, basically a chain of organic units bonded together by urethane or carbamate links, and you can it's a reaction polymer and the same class as epoxies and, and, and polyesters. The key thing is you can vary quite a lot. Uh, the amount of cross-linking between the uh, individual uh, polymer chains and also within the chains you can use different types of isocyanates and polyols to affect the, 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 the toughness, the, the, the elasticity. And so there's a lot of variability within polyurethane chemistry. So it lends itself to um, very well to erosion resistance. The reason why it works so well is Polyurethane and rubbers in general have, uh, because uh, the, the elastomeric nature, is they have the ability to absorb energy uh, within the sort of hysteresis loop. Um, yeah, and energy, as we know, has to be conserved. But the impact coming from the rain and the sand and the, and, and, and the gravel hits the polyurethane. That then deforms, and the energy is lost within the hy hysteresis of the rubber. So. What that means is the energy is absorbed into the polyurethane and is not transmitted to the substrate below which the polyurethane is protecting. Thus, it keeps the, the, the integrity of the, the, the metal or the composite uh, below. 
So I'll just come on a bit more detail about sprayable uh, coatings. And they've been historically uh, around for quite a while now. They are, as I say, easy to apply on large surface. And because they tend to be fairly thin in coatings, they have particularly good anchorage uh, uh, to, to metals. Uh, and also, therefore, perform a particularly good, um, because they wet the surface quite nicely, uh, uh, a very good uh, corrosion protection. Generally, tend to be used for the more lightweight uh, areas of an aircraft, and also those areas that are probably not as erosion uh, resistant. The key issue, I think, it, well, one of the issues is, as I mentioned before, is that they have EHR issues. Uh, there are two parts, so there are cyanates, and also there are VOC issues in your, the, 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 the solvent carrier uh, that they're taken up into in order to enable them to be sprayed. One of the key issues is, is because you're spraying, you're spraying a relatively low solids uh, solution in order to get the thick, final thickness, cured thickness of the PU you need, uh, you have to then apply probably several layers. But in between, you have to allow each individual layer to cure. And that can take a long, quite a long time, particularly if it's on a, on a, on a complex shape. So applying it in a mass production environment, I, I could foresee there may be productivity issues. And another problem is also, uh, particularly on fast rotating uh, parts, uh, fan blades and rotor blades, is the balance between the individual blades. Uh, keeping that, that or keep maintaining the uh, caliper uh, on a sprayable PU is, is, is a lot more difficult. Um, and so the, the mass between individual blades needs to, obviously needs to be controlled and it's a lot more difficult to do that with a spraying process uh, than it is uh, with a, a tape process. So having mentioned tape, I should move on to that. Um, Three, I've had the polyurethane technology. It basically, it, you know, as I mentioned before, it's a polyurethane is a tough uh, puncture-resistant uh, elastomer, but which we extrude uh, into tapes. One of the key benefits of having a tape as opposed to a, perhaps a, a spraying system is you have a uniform caliper and weight. So, it is, you know, so then you, each roll, uh, so therefore each rotor blade and each roll of tape or each fan blade will have the same mass, providing they obviously is cut to the same size, will have the same mass on each blade, and therefore you're not having so much of a balance issue uh, uh, between the individual blades. Because it comes in a tape, normally these are, uh, say, self-adhesive uh, back to uh, currently, is they're relatively easy to apply. Uh, now, I wouldn't say you do a sticky tape, but uh, it's it's self-adhesive, so you can remove one and relatively, and that has uh, a lot of relevance, particularly in service, in military service, but obviously in terms of serviceability, it's much easier and quicker to apply and remove tape on a, uh, in, in service uh, and get the aircraft back into uh, into operation with a tape. You do not, you don't necessarily require perhaps uh, a hangers to do it, you can do it online, you can do it in the server, you can do it in the field. These are normally uh, furnished with a very high shear pressure sensitive adhesive uh, that needs to be fairly robust, not only to resist sort of chemicals and, and undercut of chemicals, but also uh, forces acting particularly on rotating parts where there's obviously high CF forces involved. The adhesive needs to resist, the shearing adhesive needs to be able to resist those forces Otherwise, it's going to effectively slide off the end of the rotor or, or, or fan blade. Uh, nowadays, though, we've moved on from um, self-adhesive <coughs> because pressure sensitive can only do so much. They only have a, a certain amount of shear and they are viscoelastic, so prone to creep. So nowadays, we've come up with uh, polyurethane films that can actually be bonded uh, with either a room temperature cu curing two-part epoxy, or now, and I'll come on to a bit more later, as co-cured as part of the actual composite manufacturing process, uh, which I'll uh, come on to a bit, come on to a bit uh, later. Just want to give you an evolution of uh, where we where we've been here. I mean, 3M have been doing this uh, for sorry about that. Uh, for an awful long time. We've been making um, polyurethane tapes uh, for knocking on 50 years. Um, it, make, it surprised me, I didn't know this, but actually, back in the, back in the Vietnam War, uh, the, the rotor blades, and I guess they must have been the Hueys, uh, were actually protected uh, with 
a very first uh, generation of polyurethane tape to protect the tapes uh, from rain erosion, sorry, operating in obviously the jungles. And since then, we've moved the technology forward. Um, so we started off with fairly crude, um, not particularly erosion resistant, if you like, uh, polyurethane with uh, rubber based adhesives. We then moved into sort of um, acrylic adhesives. We then looked in, into then where you can see here actually manufacturing radomes. So we're actually thermoforming uh, the, the, the tape into actual formed parts, which is because it's obviously not it, it's not practical or not even to actually try and to apply 2D tape to a 3D surface because you get all sorts of seams and joints. Obviously, in an end-to-end -end, uh, environment, they would be attacked and, and, and ripped out. So we now actually mould a whole. Uh, radomes, uh, antennae, wingtips, boots that fit the exact particular platform in the aircraft. And then we then moved on, skipping a couple of years, into looking at then, well, how do we then move that technology on further? So we improved high shear adhesives, then we moved um, into then high impact erosion protection. We then took that technology on to actually paint uh, replacement, where we actually developed a, uh, this time a fluorolastomer film, that actually is designed to replace uh, top coats uh, on aircraft. And then we then moved into uh, heating, uh, heated leading edge tape. Um, but what, is, what I want to do is what I touched on um, two of those applications. Okay, so what we've got here is, is the tapes we have, we, yeah, we've got just to show through the sort of variety of products we have, we have um, solutions basically from multiple platforms, uh, all sorts of different environments, metals as well as composites. And again, it, depending on the environment, the application, where the where the where the aircraft are being used, we have a sort of a tape that can um, or technology that can actually look at that. Okay, so. <clears throat> Okay, so I want to touch on uh, application. So major in terms of in terms of application, the major application is protection protection of leading edges, and you can see here um, a before and after uh, protection of the C-130 that's flew through a tropical storm. The uh, picture on the right is obviously the one protected with the tape. The black area there is tape, and you can see there on the picture on the left that it's. Uh, flying through that tropical storm uh, has taken away at least the top coat uh, and revealing the uh, yellow primer. And there are some areas I think where the primer has actually been taken away as well. Uh, we do then, as I mentioned, fluid and barrier control, <coughs> particularly for, <coughs> excuse me, primarily for uh, interior of aircraft to protect uh, acidic fluids getting to through the floorboards to the floor beams. Impact protection, helicopter rotor protection, uh, flu fluoropolymer applique, which is basically paint replacement, okay, and uh, molded boots. So I want to talk on, touch on two of those, one, two of those uh, applications, just to show you why the tapes get used and, and the changes we made to develop these ones. So we've got a tape called 8641, uh, which is sometimes known as belly tape, designed for aircraft that land on unmade strips, and you can see that uh, C-130 uh, landing there. Uh, kicking up a whole load of rubbish uh, as it lands. It's there to protect, not necessarily from the sand that's being kicked up behind it, but larger, um, larger fod, stones, boulders, bricks in this case, <coughs> that get kicked up from the undercarriage uh, and can damage into the um, belly panels, causing them need to be replaced. You can see here that the whole underside of the fuselage of the C-130 for those aircraft that operate in those sorts of environments is covered with a, a specific tape. And it's not just polyurethane. Uh, it's there. Polyurethane generally will be able to handle small impact erosion, uh, sand erosion, but we're talking here quite large, quite large um, boulders kicking up at a pretty high velocity. So the force, as you can see, is force time, is, is mass times acceleration is a lot higher here. So we had to think, well, we can't just use a conventional polyurethane tape. How is it? How can we provide an extra cushioning that absorbs that impact, taking that energy away from damaging the substrates? And you see the aircraft here is then placed on the fuselage, size of the fuselage. Here it's designed here to stop ice being flung off the propellers uh, into the damage in the fuselage. 
and also here we have it on the inboard flap of the 737. Um, again, protect uh, the damage of that flap from the gravel and stones that are kicked up from the runway. And the way we did that is we took our existing polyurethane technology, which provides a level of uh, impact resistance. We then married that up with a cushioned uh, foam adhesive that, uh, again, adds even more impact. So you can see it's a cushioning um, thing. It so shows that, again, there's no one application. We couldn't, you couldn't put a conventional polyurethane on, on the belly of these aircraft because it wouldn't have the impact resistance. So we had to develop a, a tape that um, was capable of absorbing the, absorbing the extra energy uh, from the very large um, FOD that was uh, kicked up on the, uh, on the carriage. <clears throat> Another application that, uh, again, just showing the environment we had to work in is, is uh, as you seen before, is, is, is uh, rotor blade protection. Obviously, a lot of it is, uh, particularly military aircraft, they're obviously operating in uh, sandy environments, and a particularly harsh environment, and there are different sand, we found uh, there are different degrees of harshness of sand, depending on where you are in the world, and, and different uh, deserts have different cause different degrees of, of erosion. Um, obviously there's a high rotational speed of the parts, the rotor blades are rotating rapidly, but also they need to be able to work into rain and also uh, sand as well. The key issue here is you need a high shear adhesive, obviously uh, on the tail rotors particularly, which rotate at much higher uh, rotational velocity, uh, you need an adhesive that is capable of withstanding the CF forces um, generated from the rotor blades. Um, <clears throat> what the tape does is, is, is it's capable of withstanding those, for, those shear forces, it eliminates the, the blade from, from being damaged and the metallic shields from being damaged, uh, increases obviously the durability of that metallic shield uh, in a sandy environment, you know, thus extending the surface life and the operational availability of the aircraft. We've, from some, we've done some work uh, for some flight trials and we, 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 we estimate that you can you extension you can extend the life of a blade by applying uh, an appropriate amount of polyurethane uh, tape on the rotor blade from anything from 20 to 400 flying hours depending on the number of landings and uh, takeoff and landings that are going. And here you can see is uh, some data we've managed, we've collected from some flight trials we did, uh, and basically some before and after. On the left hand side, left hand side you can see aircraft that have operated in sandy uh, desert landings um, without tape protection and the number of uh, damaged blades that occurred uh, was considerably signif more significant uh, from the right hand side where a tape erosion scheme was deployed onto the rotor blades to protect them from that environment. Since then we've done a lot of learning and we've moved on the chemistry. We've, as I mentioned before, polyurethane you, is, is a fairly flexible chemistry and you could build in extra uh, building blocks into the actual molecular structure. Uh, to improve erosion, and so we've moved on to our second generation chemistry now, uh, 8542, uh, which is much tougher because of the, the chemistry we employ on the polyurethane is a, is a much tougher in both sand and rain erosion. And we then also further looked at, well, looked at the attachment system. You'll notice on the, on the graph on the right there's three columns of, of 8542. The same film has been used, but what we've done, we've looked at using a different attachment system. Uh, the, the, the second column in is with the standard high shear uh, self adhesive. The second column is actually using a two part structural paste. And the third column is then co is curing that with a uh, toughened film adhesive. And what these uh, attachment methods now do is because you're now using a toughened epoxy as the attachment system, the adhesives themselves, these epoxy adhesives are toughened and they are offering a degree of impact resistance and erosion resistance as well as the polyurethane. So you're adding an additional, um, not, not, a, not an additional layer, but it's a, a means to absorb more impact. So you get the impact from the rain, the sand, the polyurethane absorbs some, and also the epoxy uh, below it also uh, absorbs some as well. So you're getting much more durable um, erosion performance from the same tape, but using a different way of uh, attaching it. And so then we've looked on about one of the key issues is we know we have reasonably good um, performance in terms of sand erosion, and you saw it's extension from sort of 20 to 400 hours uh, in terms of uh, blade life. 
but one of the key things is well sand erosion is one thing but then rain erosion is, is also another and there are different mechanisms uh, different forces that operate and so it's difficult sometimes to get uh, a material that is very really good at sand erosion uh, that is also very really good at rain erosion uh, metal uh, titanium is particularly relatively poor at uh, sand erosion whereas it's particularly very you know, it doesn't have, tend to have an issue with rain erosion and polyurethane is, is vice versa for polyurethane so we've tried to work on with our, our, our development people in the US to think well how can we actually combine those two and move towards a greater uh, rain erosion performance whilst maintaining uh, a reasonable good degree of uh, sand erosion and so we've looked at developing a couple of pro and these are purely prototypes at this stage they're, they're not uh, commercially available or anything else but it just shows that the uh, that we move trying to move the technology forward <clears throat> to develop a, a, a more all-round or all weather uh, type of uh, erosion resistance so you can see here that basically here is a, a standard uh, chemistry product and you can and this is what we've done here we've uh, sandblasted these first and then put them through rain erosion after so they've had sand erosion and rain erosion and obviously the sand starts to um, pit the, 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 the polyurethane and then the larger full, higher impact of the rain erosion then start to take that mineral tear away and it is really quite an arduous test and you can see here on the left that you can see the pitting that that's that, that test method has, has caused uh, and with the new sort of developments we're coming up with we've managed to certainly extend that uh, from, from yeah, anything from 60 to 60 to 120 minutes to over talking and with no pitting at all uh, up to 180 minutes so moving on again again move, trying to move the technology on uh, polyurethane is, is, is as I mentioned is, is a thermoplastic material and has sort of temperature resistance you know, for probably up to about 80 90 degrees before it starts to soften uh, and that doesn't uh, bring into play the adhesives as well but, but actually bonding self adhesives also uh, similarly will soften so we had an application where we were asked to uh, provide a uh, try and develop a, a polyurethane tape that's capable of standing 180 degrees uh, which is quite a significant increase in terms of the temperature uh, uh, environment that it was I think. so we developed a, uh, a, a polyurethane chemistry that enables it to now to, to deliver uh, temperature resistance up to 180 degrees uh, and also then we've also for this particular adhesive and it was designed primarily for the leading edges edges of the C130s that where they have recycled engine bleed air that heats up the leading edges um, whilst they're on the ground and taxiing the actual surface of the actual leading edges it does get incredibly warm and, and up to 180 degrees can get up to 180 degrees while they're taxiing and standing and obviously not in the cooling airflow so um, which would have blistered and, and, and then started to, to melt conventional polyurethane so we developed a, uh, a high temperature uh, resistant material that say is capable of withstanding 180 degrees which then enabled us to, to say well actually now we've now developed a very high temperature material what now can we uh, can we look to extend that uh, uh, capability into protecting other parts well given it's capable of resisting up to 180 degrees and even 200 degrees uh, sort of temperatures the ideal uh, logical extension of that and the logical use of this product is to use it in composite manufacture uh, and so we developed a, a range of uh, non-adhesive uh, tapes in this particular so it's just the film uh, that is designed to be applied during composite production manufacture pr uh, production and so therefore eliminates uh, uh, the, the, the application uh, step post part manufacture you're actually building in an integral uh, an integral uh, amount of erosion resistance into the part rather than having to retro apply it to the part when the part is actually in service so it can be engineered into you know, engineered in to prevent uh, damage to the underlying composite uh, and then therefore reducing the maintenance cost and, and obviously keeping the aircraft flying for longer um, yeah, it has particularly unparalleled durability. Uh, it's much better than uh, we've done some work, and you'll see from the next graphs uh, that in terms of comparisons versus uh, standard uh, epoxy paints that are normally used to finish the surfaces of, comp uh, of composite, uh, the adhesive, which is then co cured with a structural film in this particular case, is much. Uh, much much better in terms of uh, erosion resistance in this particular space and also rain erosion uh, on, the, on the right hand side 
So we've developed now, moving that technology forward, we've now developed a system where you can actually build in uh, some degree of erosion resistance into the um, structure of the, of the parts being manufactured. So it's amenable to a wide range of uh, process conditions. It can be co-cured uh, with uh, standard uh, curing temperatures at 120 or uh, 180. Uh, it's compatible with most um, pre-preg resins, although we recommend the use of a structural film with easier to make sure there's sufficient uh, uh, resin to bond the, uh, the, the film. It's a, it can be co-cured, or it can, even be, it can be bonded even post-curing. Uh, you, you either do it as a co-cure operation, or bonding to a, a cured part, or even apply uh, even on a, using a, a room temperature curing uh, systems to apply it. It has a blend of thermoplastic. It's quite a strange material. It has a blend of thermoplastic and thermoset material. Obviously, the thermoset allows it to give the temperature resistance, but because it's thermoplastic. It can be molded into a shape, so you can pre-mold shapes for very complex 3D uh, 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 shapes. That, so again, obviously I mentioned earlier on with the radomes, you need uh, to have a, a molded shape, otherwise you're going to get creases in and take trying to apply a 2D uh, piece of tape over a molded area. Because it has this sort of thermoplastic fiber, it self seams during the curing process because it's beginning to flow uh, and stretch a little bit. It then seals or any overlap to its seal themselves, which has a huge benefit. Is when then here is when you can actually then um, lay up multiple layers, and these individual layers will bond to themselves. So you can start to create put weight where you need it. So you can put. Area, thicker areas of, of, of la and layers of this uh, co-curable tape where the erosion is the greatest and obviously use a thinner film or less material where the erosion is not quite as great, uh, thus keeping the weight uh, down. So potential applications for this are obviously as composite, as, as composite map Parts are, are, are becoming more and more common, so we now know uh, composites are moving into uh, fan blades, uh, composite uh, OGVs, uh, fan casings now um, are all becoming uh, made out of composite. Uh, rotor blades have been composite for an awfully long time. Propeller blades now are also composite. So all of this, this product can actually be co-cured into these, the process and manufacture of some of these particular parts. Uh, and other composite parts as well that may any any way frankly any composite part uh, that is going to be exposed to a, an erosive media or, or impact even like landing gear doors and stuff like that so any part that is going to have or potentially have or come into contact with uh, rain sand gravel or whatever else this material can actually be able to be cured as an integral part of the part design So, because this, uh, the, the film is now being structurally bonded uh, to the composite part, it no longer has the flexibility of being removed quite easily as the self-adhesive uh, uh, polyurethane tapes did. So that then begs the question, well, how do you then repair this in service? Uh, so we then had to think about that. Thing. So we've come up with a, a repair. Uh, adhesive, uh, which is designed basically fundamentally to reserve to, to, to pair the damaged parts of the polyurethane tape. And we have to admit that you know, polyurethane tape is going to be eroded. It is a sacrificial layer. Um, it is not you know, robust. But whilst it is there, it, uh, being eroded, it is protecting the part below, which is the key, key message to get across. And so in order to maintain that uh, protection, you then need to either uh, repair or, or be able to repair the polyurethane film when eventually it does erode away. And so for the structural um, co-curable product, we developed a, uh, a repair paste that cures, cures and fundamentally this material is actually tougher uh, than the actual polyurethane it's replacing. It's easily applied through a sort of static mixer, uh, so you're getting the accurate mix ratios, etc. Uh, has a particularly far, fast cure cycle, which obviously means the repairs can be effected very fast, and therefore getting the aircraft back into the, uh, uh, the air quicker. Uh, and you can see here again, uh, this is a self-adhesive material we repaired. You can see the craters here 
uh, that were exposed after uh, rain and sand erosion, uh, and then material comes complete with a, 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 a film, plastic film, that enables you to get a very, very nice uh, aerodynamic profile. So it's not just a case of palleting uh, this material into into the holes, uh, trying to fill them out and everything else. You get you use this. Uh, paste has been specifically designed for repair of polyurethane films. It's not a, uh, a just an epoxy adhesive that is, is used as a patch repair. So this machine is actually designed specifically for the repairs of structural bonding films. Uh, and that, I think I'm almost run out of time. Uh, it took a lot that long, we're actually longer than I actually anticipated. I do apologise for keeping you from your lunch uh, or, <laughs> or giving you indigestion, whichever the case may be. Um, but uh, thank you for listening. And for any questions, if you, I think you can use the system to email them through. I don't know if Rachel will uh, discuss on how we do that. Well, thanks, Andy, for that, first of all. Um, I'm afraid we might not be able to take any questions now. However, we'll leave it open for you to send any question in right now. Otherwise, just contact us on any of those channels or on these emails through LinkedIn, whatever, you, whatever channel you prefer, and we will try to get back to you as soon as we can. Um, again, thank you, Andy, and thanks everyone for joining us today. We will send you a recording of the webinar and a copy of the presentation. Um, the next webinar is scheduled as well for September at this point, and we'll, again, we'll be talking about composites and particularly how to repair composite materials. Yeah, exciting times. So we all see you all there and thank you again.